So, uh, hello everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Site Code User Group India. Uh, today we have Corey Smith with us. Uh, he is uh, he is uh, Site Code uh, enthusiast and he is in Site Code Technology MVP. Uh, today's topic is uh, tips and tricks for next chairs and site core headless. So uh, basically in this topics, you will uh, get to know about the practical techniques to optimize your site core headless solution built with the next chairs. And uh, you will get some tips and tricks around that. Uh, during the session, if you have any questions, you can post it to the chat window and uh, we will cover those uh, session at the end of uh, the webinar. Over to you, Corey. All right, thank you. Great introduction. Really excited to be here. So I'm Corey Smith. I'm an independent consultant based in Atlanta, Georgia in the US. Uh, I'm an eight time Sitecore MVP of technology. I have over nine years of Sitecore experience. Um, I'm a happy dad to a toddler, and I'm also big into lawn care and smooth jazz. So if you like those things, reach out. You can find me on Slack at Sitecore, and my website blog is coreysmith.co. Every Friday at 12.15 p.m. Eastern Time in the U.S., uh, I co-host Sitecore Lunch with my good friend and fellow Sitecore MVP, Jim Patillo. Sitecore Lunch is an opportunity for the Sitecore community to get together and talk about Sitecore or anything else that's on our mind. Uh, so here's a screenshot from one of the Sitecore Lunches. You can see that we have a, a pretty good group every week. Uh, would love to see you there tomorrow. Um, again, that'll be at 12.15 p.m. Eastern Time. It's every Friday, and promptly at 12.15, I post the details in the Sitecore Slack general channel. So um, please join us. If you're not on the Sitecore Slack, you can join at that URL there, the sitecore.chat. And yep, again, would love to see you tomorrow. Okay, so our first tip today um, is one that you should be able to start using right away on your Next.js projects, and this one's called debug logging. Sitecore's Next.js SDK ships with pretty extensive debug logging provided by an NPM package called debug. When this is enabled, it will start outputting a lot of debug logs to your server console and your browser for things like layout service requests and dictionary service requests. And this is going to be really useful for debugging issues with your site. It's easy to turn this on. Um, it's hiding in every Sitecore Next.js project in the .env file. Um, all you have to do is go in your .env file, and you'll have a block of comments like this. If you uncomment this line right here um, and then rerun your app, you'll start seeing those debug logs in the console. And this line right here will enable all of the logs that Sitecore has made available. You can be a little bit more selective. So if you wanna see just the layout service logs, you can uncomment this line and this will filter down to just layout service logs. The debug functionality uh, even lets you get more granular than that. So if you uncomment this line, you'll see all the logs except for the layout service logs. So you can really tweak that to your needs. Something that you won't see in the .env file is this setting, um, debug underscore multiline. And if you set this to true, this will make your debug logs a lot more readable in the console. So let's take a look at that. When you turn on the debug logging by default, this is what the debug logs are gonna look like in your, in your terminal from the server. It's kind of hard to read, but if you set that debug multiline equals true, uh, your come out like this, and I think that this is a lot more readable. So I always turn debug multiline uh, on when I'm when I'm using this feature. I talked about filters. So um, this is an exhaustive list of all the filters that Sitecore makes available for debug logging. Um, so if you want to turn on all debuggers, you just use the Sitecore JSS star, like I've shown here in this table. Um, but some of the things that you can filter down to are HTTP requests through the data fetchers. You could filter down to the just layout service or dictionary service calls. If you want to see what's happening in the experience editor, you can filter to the editing host. 
if you're using headless SXA, um, there's specific debug logging for the site map service, site info service, robot service, redirect service, and the error pages service. And then if you're using CDP or personalized, they've got special uh, debug log filters for those as well. So up until this point, we've been talking about looking at the debug logs really in the server console in your terminal, but you can also turn on debug logging in the browser. And the way you do that is by setting the debug property on local storage to whatever filter you want to see. So you would open up your browser console um, in the console would type local storage.debug equals and put your filter. And then from that point, um, Sitecore will start, or, or your application will start doing debug logging to the browser console like you see here. Now keep in mind, if you're just starting off on a fresh um, Sitecore project, you don't have any custom code, you're really not gonna see anything in the browser right away because uh, by default, most everything gets executed server side, all your layout service requests and dictionary service requests. So you won't see this, but we'll come back to this in a minute and I'll show you some, some places where this will be useful. To recap, you can e enable debug logging for your server in the .env file, um, add debug multiline equals true, it makes things a lot more readable. If you want to turn on debug logging in the browser, um, you just set the debug property on local storage in the browser console to whatever filter you want. And just like Sitecore has their own namespaces for, um, for debug logging, like the Sitecore hyphen JSS, you can make your own. Um, and if you wanna learn more about how to do that, uh, I highly recommend that you check out the debug documentation on the NPM JS website. And then if you just want to like learn more about the filters that are available and, and what Sitecore ships with, they've got pretty good documentation on that as well at that URL. All right, tip number two, where you're going to look at JSS data fetchers. So the Sitecore JSS library exports three data fetchers that you can use in your application. And this is for making API calls, uh, right? Um, the, the three that are available to you are the native data fetcher, which is a wrapper around fetch. There's the Axios data fetcher, which is a wrapper around Axios. And then there's the GraphQL request client. And the GraphQL request client is really built for making uh, GraphQL calls to the Sitecore APIs. I would say for in general, don't even worry about the Axios data fetcher. You're probably never gonna use it and shouldn't use it. You should be using, however, to make API calls, the native data fetcher. Like I said, it wraps fetch. And Vercel, the creators of Next.js, they have their own implementation of fetch in your Next.js application. So if you use the native data fetcher uh, that wraps fetch, you're gonna get any improvements that Vercel makes to fetch for free over time. Uh, so some things that Vercel has implemented like um, request deduplication, uh, caching, like those are things that you'll just get for free if you use the native data fetcher that you wouldn't necessarily get with Axios. Um, the GraphQL request client, what's really cool about that is um, it's configured to uh, handle rate limiting of the Sitecore APIs, and it also has retry logic built in. The thing that's really cool about using all three of these is they actually implement debug logging like I talked about before. And we'll take a look at that in a second, but if you use these, you get debug logging for your uh, API calls for free. To use them, it's pretty easy. So this is an example of using the native data fetcher. You just import it from the Sitecore JSS library like this, and then new up a new instance of it, and yeah, call a fetch against the URL that you wanna get data from. It's, it's pretty straightforward. It's not very different than using fetch directly. Like I said, the nice thing about using these data fetchers is that you get the debug logging for free. So if you set um, debug equals Sitecore JSS HTTP like this, and of course, always turn on debug multiline equals true. Then anytime uh, you use one of these data fetchers, particularly for server side calls, um, then in your terminal, you'll see the requests and the responses of um, any fetches that you make. 
Uh, like I said before, you can also turn on the debug logging in the browser like this by setting the debug property on local storage. And when you set that to Sitecore JSS HTTP, then anytime you make client side requests using one of these data fetchers, those will show up in the browser console like this. So that's really handy. To recap, use the native data fetcher instead of fetch in your applications. You probably don't need the Axios data fetcher, but it's there. If you're calling Sitecore GraphQL APIs, use the GraphQL request client. And the nice thing about all these is that you get the debug logging for free. Tip number three is component level data fetching. So we're going to look at a technique um, in the Sitecore JSS Next.js framework to do server-side data fetching. We'll start by looking at a typical data fetching scenario in a React component. So anytime that you want to make an API call in a React component, your code is going to look like this. Right? Um, you're going to use a combination of use state and use effect hooks, as I've shown here. You'll declare some state with use state. And then inside of a use effect hook, that's where you'll actually be making your API call. So you'll call fetch, for example, and then once the call is finished, your API call, you'll update your state. And when the state gets updated, this will trigger a re-render of your component with the data from your API. While the API call is executing or before, you might want to show a loader like I've shown here. And then, of course, once the, the API data is available, you'll re-render the component and present that. This is a standard pattern anytime you want to make API calls in React. But the big problem here is use effect because use effect only executes on the client and in the browser. It never executes on the server. Consequence of this is um, when you use this use effect pattern um, and you make an API call, you're going to see a flash of content when your page loads like this. So here I've got a component that's making an API call. You can see that it when the page first loads, the user is going to see that loading message. And then once the API call finishes, it'll refresh. This isn't the best user experience, and it can have negative impacts on SEO for your site. But the cool thing is Next.js has a solution for this at the page level. That comes in the form of two functions. One is called get static props and get server side props. These are special functions that Next.js makes available to you. Get static props you use when you're doing um, SSG, static site generation, and you use get server side props when you're doing SSR or server side rendering. So let's take a look at an example. So in a, a standard Next.js application, and you can do this in a Sitecore application as well, um, on your page, at the page level, you can export a function called get static props or get server side props, like I've done here, right alongside your page. And then inside this function, you can um, make API calls. So you could call fetch, um, or you could do some computationally intensive tasks. Uh, you could do whatever you want here um, that you want to get called during server side rendering. And then um, after you've done that, then you just return your data that you get back from your API, for example. And what Next will do is it'll automatically pass whatever is the result of this function to your page as a prop. And then your page, of course, can pass that down to its child components for use inside of there. So this is pretty cool, SSR data fetching in, in Next.js. But it's the, the, the technique of putting this at the page level has some problems. So if you can only execute this function at the page level and you have a bunch of components on the page um, that need data fetch server side, then you have to go and at the page level request data for all your components at one time. So you can see here that I've got component one, two, three, four. They all need some data fetch server side. And so since I have to do this fetching at the page level, I have to request all of their data right there ahead of time. And this isn't very clean, right? Like this kind of the data fetching code is kind of far from our component code. Um, also, in a Sitecore application, this can be problematic because in a Sitecore application, 
we don't know all the components that are going to get rendered on a page ahead of time. That's decided by the content authors. The content authors build the pages dynamically. So it would be a very wasteful for us to go and make API calls at the page level for all potential components that are going to render on the page. So the cool thing is Sitecore has actually come up with a solution for this and allows us not only to declare get server side props and get static props at the page level, but we can actually do it at the component level as well. So let's take a look. Here's our example from before of a simple React component that's making an API call to the cat fact API. And we can refactor this to use component level data fetching and do this API call server side instead of client side. And the way that you do it is this. You can see the component seems to look a lot simpler. And really what I've changed here is just alongside my component, I've exported get server side props. So this is getting exported alongside the component, not the page this time. And inside of that, I make my API call. And then once the API call completes, I return that data. And Sitecore is going to handle automatically passing this prop to my component, and then I just render it. And so the cool thing about this is there's not going to be any loader. I don't need a loader because this is going to get baked into the HTML that's served up from the server. So our diagram from before, it doesn't even need to be animated because as soon as the person gets the page, that API call was called during server-side rendering and it's available. There's no loader necessary. So this is a really cool feature, but there's one thing that you need to be aware of if you're on the JSS libraries before 21.6.4. If your libraries are using the most recent version of JSS, um, where, where you've upgraded to 21.6.4 or later, you don't need to worry about this. But if you suspect that you're on an earlier version in your application, beware. Page level get static props and get server side props are excluded from the code that's sent to the browser. They're excluded from the client bundle. And this makes sense because these functions are only executed during server-side rendering. They don't need to make it to the browser. Uh, and, and that's great. Uh, with, as a result of that, you can put connection strings in those functions. You can put API secrets. You put anything. You don't have to worry about it leaking up to the browser. However, component level get static props and get server-side props are not excluded from the client bundle in versions of JSS before 21.6.4. This is a bug, or this was a bug in JSS. And as a result, if you're on JSS 21, or a version of JSS before 21.6.4, you cannot put sensitive data in the component level get static props or get server side props functions. If you put a connection string in those functions at the component level, or you put a password, or you put an API secret, that code is going to be made available in the browser and some clever person could actually look at your bundles and get those secrets and, and take advantage of them. So let's keep this in mind. Um, even with this bug, I think there's a lot of value in using these component level data fetching functions. Um, so yeah, um, recap, use get static props in your components, use get server side props in your components, if possible, upgrade your libraries to JSS 21.6.4 or higher so you don't have to worry about that concern I brought up. But if you can't upgrade, then just make sure that you do not put sensitive data in either of those functions under any circumstance. Some further reading. Um, first URL, that will take you to the JSS 21.6.4 release where they fixed that bug that I was just talking about. Um, if you're kind of interested to see what was going on with that problem, uh, I link to the issue that I opened on GitHub about that. Um, Sitecore has got some really good documentation on component level data fetching, and then Vercel's got good documentation on the page level data fetching if you want to read more. Tip number four, data fetching libraries. So we just took a look at um, doing data fetching on the server during SSG or SSR, and now we're gonna pivot up to the client and look at a way to make your data fetching in the browser a lot more simple. So again, we looked at this simple, the simple example of a React component that's making an API call before 
anytime you want to make an API call, you use the use state hook. Inside of the use effect hook, you can call fetch, for example. And then once your fetch call finishes, it's going to update state. While the fetch call is executing, you might show a loader. And then once it's finished, you'll actually show the API data. And this works, but there's a much better, cleaner way that doesn't involve two hooks and all of this ceremony. And the cleaner way comes from a library called SWR. This stands for stale while revalidate. And this is really just one nice hook that you can use for data fetching. You don't have to use those two hooks like I showed before. Um, this is developed by Vercel, the team that maintains Next.js. So uh, it integrates with Next.js quite nicely. This is what it looks like. Um, so here inside of our component, instead of having to use use state and use effect, you can use one hook called use SWR, and it looks like this. Um, you pass to it the URL that you want to call, and then the second thing that you pass to it is a generic fetcher function. And this is just a, just a generic function that tells SWR how to go get your data. Um, because SWR itself doesn't actually do any fetching, it's just going to call your function that you give it. SWR returns a whole host of things to you that you can use. The things that you'll use most commonly and that are most useful are um, the is loading property. So this is a true false Boolean that will tell you whether or not your API call has finished loading. Um, it'll return error data if an error happens. And then of course data will come back and that'll actually have the data from your API. And now your code's a lot cleaner because um, for example, you can show a loader just based on an is loading variable rather than like checking if state is null or something. Um, and then otherwise just show your data that comes back from your API. But that's not all that you get with SWR. SWR comes with a whole bunch of features that you get for free. So SWR has auto refetching, request deduplication baked in. Um, it handles dependent queries, for example. So if you've got a component that needs multiple API calls to execute and they have dependencies on each other, it can handle that very well. SWR can do prefetching and caching. It does pagination, infinite scroll, and it has native TypeScript support. It's a really powerful library. So next, let's take a look at two of those features in action. So here I've got a page that's got a cat fat component on it four times. It's the same component put on the page four times. And uh, it's loaded. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start clicking in and out of the browser. So you can see my mouse is just clicking in and out of the browser. And every time I click in and out of the browser, we're getting new cat facts from the API. And this is a feature that you get for free. You don't, you don't have to enable anything. You don't do anything. As soon as you start using that use SWR hook, you'll notice this become active in your applications. It's pretty cool. So just a good way to make sure that your users um, always have the, the latest data from your APIs. Um, anytime they click in and out of the browser, the APIs will refresh. There's another thing going on here. Um, and that's request deduplication, another feature that you get for free. So I mentioned that I've got this cat fact component on the page four times. If this cat fact component were implemented using that use state, use effect hook pattern, on every single one of these components, you would see a different cat fact, right? Because it would be making four API calls, one API call for each component. SWR is smart enough to see that on your page, the same API call is being made for multiple components, and it will deduplicate that request and make it one time and then share the result with every component. So you can see here that we get the exact same cat fact shared across our components. Quite nice. It's a, a, a free performance feature that you get. And again, you don't even have to do anything to turn that on. As soon as you start using that use SWR hook, this will kick in for you. I showed previously that you have to provide SWR a generic fetcher function. Cool thing about this is that you can use the JSS fetching functions with SWR. So instead of just using fetch, 
if you pass a fetcher function that uses the native data fetcher from JSS like this uh, and supply it to SWR, um, then you're going to get debug logging for free. So with this code, now when SWR executes in the browser, I can turn on debug logging and any SWR call that I see that's using that native data fetcher, it's going to get logged to the browser. So that's pretty neat. SWR has a browser extension that you can use called SWR DevTools. This is a really cool feature. Um, you can look at the cache that SWR has built up. You can look at the history of calls that have been made throughout your application, and you can see the network requests. So to recap, SWR, it simplifies and supercharges data fetching code, but it's not the only game in town. So there's actually another library that's very similar to SWR called React Query. I've used React Query on projects with great success. I think it's a good library as well. Um, and if you've not used either of these, I highly recommend that you uh, check both of them out before settling on one for your team. You can check out SWR and the SWR dev tools at these two URLs. And if you're interested in React Query, URL for that is there. So tip number five, we are going to look at providing mock data in pages and the experience editor using the previous two tips that we just looked at. Sitecore developers are really tasked with building two applications when they build a website for Sitecore. You're building the application that the end users see but you're also building an application for your content authors to build the pages using your components. Something that I always stress is that pages in the experience editor, they are only for designing layouts. They are not for testing your APIs. What I mean by this is that in pages in the experience editor, your application should not be making any API calls. In these experiences, your components should be serving up mock data for your APIs to give your content authors an idea of what the component might look like when it's on the live site, but it shouldn't actually be making API calls to get live data. The biggest reason for this is that with a React application, Next.js application, React re-renders or any kind of client-side rendering can break the experience editor. So let's take a look back at our example component from before that's refactored a little bit. So here I'm making an API call to the CatFact, CatFact API. And inside of my component, what I do is while that API call is rendering, I show a loader. But once that API call is finished, I show the data from the API. But most importantly for this discussion, when the loading is finished, I show an image field from Sitecore using the image field helper and I render a placeholder from Sitecore. If you do this conditional rendering pattern where you block loading of the image field helper or a placeholder, for example, you're gonna break the experience editor, absolutely. Kind of things that you'll run into, inline editing won't work for the field helpers. Um, when you first add the component into the experience editor using the insert button, the component won't render and placeholders won't work in this scenario. So when you try to use that placeholder that I showed, you'll start getting messages like could not find the rendering in the HTML loaded from the server. So these are some of the issues that you can run into by doing client side rendering or making API calls inside of the experience editor or pages. So now I'd like to look at a way that we can avoid this pattern using serving up mock data. So again, here's our component. This is going to cause problems for us because it's doing conditional rendering um, of a loader when we're in the experience editor and pages. And we can refactor this to fix this problem. And this is how we would do it. So we're going to use the component level data fetching functions to provide mock data when we're in the experience editor or pages, but provide that mock data without making client side calls. This looks like a lot of code, but we can break it down and it's not too bad. Um, alongside our component, we just export our get server side props function like this. 
could also be get static props. The first thing that we do inside of this function is we look at the layout data and figure out if we're in pages or in the experience editor. If we're not, don't do anything. The application can do client side rendering, it can do um, conditional rendering outside of the experience editor and page is fine. So we don't do anything for that scenario. But if we are in the experience editor pages, then our function will return some mock data. It's mock data, it could come from a JSON file, could be hard coded here, whatever. Then get server side props in the experience editor and pages will provide this mock data as a prop to your component. What you do is if you're using SWR, then you take this data and you pass it to SWR's fallback data property. SWR will provide this fallback data while the API call is executing. So now, instead of having to show a loader, um, when SWR goes and makes your API call, it will immediately return the fallback data. And then when the API call finishes, it'll return the data from the API. Um, so yeah, great. This gives us a, a way to provide some mock data to SWR, but we've still got a problem. We do not want that API call to execute in the experience editor or pages, right? We All we want SWR to do in experience editor and the pages is just return our fallback data. And that's a pretty easy thing to control. So SWR has a feature, uh, a global configuration feature where you can set SWR settings at a global level. And the way that you would do that is on your page, you would go and create a SWR config component like this. And what you do is on SWR config, you tell it um, to disable revalidate on focus and revalidate on mount when we're in the experience editor. And so this solves all our problems. When we're in the experience editor, what will happen is that SWR call, it'll serve up the fallback data and stop. It won't make API calls at all anymore. Um, so yeah, that's that's quite nice. It solves our problems in, in a really clean way. We can provide uh, mock data for the experience editor and pages, but we can also keep that client side rendering um, code in place for the live site. So to recap, don't call APIs in pages or the experience editor because client side rendering of JSS field helpers and placeholders are going to break experience editor functionality. To work around this, you can use get server side props and get static props to return API mock data for editing. You then pass this mock data to SWR's fallback data property anytime you're making an API call, and then disable revalidate on mount and revalidate on focus and pages and the experience editor um, so that the API calls for the live site won't get executed. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention is that since this mock data will be coming from get server side props and get static props, you get another free feature. And that's that your mock data will not get included in the client bundle, right? Because if you're on uh, Sitecore JSS 2164 or later, they fixed a bug where that get server side props and get static props code gets included to the client bundle. So yeah, that's another neat thing that you you get here for free. All right, so the last few tips have been been pretty tech heavy. We'll have some easy tips now to get a breather. And this tip applies um, whether you're in Next.js application, Angular, MVC, XSLT, or web forms, it doesn't matter. Uh, this, this tip applies across the board and it's always define a root element. So in a Next.js application, I pretty frequently see um, components that are have a fragment wrapping them like this. And yeah, this this will break the experience editor. If you do this, um, you, you'll see some issues. Um, some of the, the things that you'll see, styles will be broken. Uh, inline field editing won't work properly when you first insert your component to the page and placeholders won't work properly either. So to work around this, just make sure that your components always have at their root, a real element such as a div or a span or anything, it just can't be that fragment. And if you do this, your content authors will be so happy and so will you, you won't have bugs or as many bugs. Um, so yeah, 
I, I want to clarify, you can still use React Fragments inside of your component. You just can't use it as the root. So you still got that option. Just don't use it at the root. Might be a good idea um, to make an ESLint or a prettier plugin to detect this issue so you can catch it on build. This next tip is also easy. This is looking at disabling Next.js telemetry. So Vercel collects a lot of telemetry um, inside of your Next.js server. If you or your clients are privacy focused and don't want to share this data, all you have to do is go into your .env file and set next telemetry disabled equals one, and that'll turn it off. Um, you just check this into Git, and yep, next time uh, your application is built, telemetry will be disabled. Sitecore has got some documentation on this. Vercel does as well. That's not the only way to turn off telemetry, but I think it's probably the easiest. So check out those URLs if interested. Okay, this tip uh, looks at a way to make your upgrades a little bit more straightforward. So Next.js applications have a next.config.js file in them where you can configure all of Next.js's options. Uh, a new Next.js application for Sitecore, it's already got a bunch of stuff configured inside of that file. Some of the things that you can configure like the distribution directory, environment variables, headers, redirects, rewrites, webpack configuration. And it's good to modify these things as you need but making those changes directly in the next config JS file uh, can kind of make your upgrades more difficult. So the JSS team has developed a, a cleaner way to do modifications of the next config. And that comes in the form of config plugins. So um, if you look in your Next.js application, your Sitecore Next.js application, you'll see that you've already got some plugins available to you under the source lib next config plugins folder. And they all look like this. Um, it's always going to take this form where you return object.assign. And then inside of that, you set just the next config properties that you want to change. Um, so this, this is quite nice. It's If you're coming from the .NET world, this is kind of similar to Sitecore config patches and web config transforms. Because what will happen is you can make a small change to the next config here. And then at build time, these all get appended to the the next config that, uh, that Next.js is going to use. Here's a very simple sample. So all you would have to do is create a file called powered by header JS inside of that plugins folder like this. And if you wanted to turn off the powered by headers, then you just set powered by header faults like I've done here. Um, and yeah, this is it. This will actually go and modify that same property in the next config JS without you having to modify that file directly. Um, I admit this is a bit of a contrived example. Probably, yeah, this is a bit overkill for a, such a small setting. But there are often features in your application that do have a lot of settings that, that kind of belong together, right? You can imagine if you had a feature that's got a bunch of rewrites and a bunch of redirects that it needs. Putting those in the next config.js file, they kind of all get separated apart don't really stick together. But if you use config plugins, you can keep all the redirects and all the rewrites and any other settings just for that feature together in one file. And I think that makes for cleaner code. And like I said, it also makes your upgrades easier. Anytime you create or change a plugin, um, just remember that you need to restart your Next.js application. They don't get hot reloaded. Um, so called JSS start or restart your rendering container. To recap, don't edit the next config.js directly. Instead, you can change next.js settings with plugins created in this plugins folder, and then always remember to rebuild your app after creating or modifying plugins. Tip number nine is next.js's bundle analyzer. This tip will help you get a better understanding of your website payloads. So to take advantage of next bundle analyzer, First thing you'll do is install this package using npm install. And then you create a next config plugin. So you can go and create in the plugins folder, create this bundle analyzer.js. 
and inside of it you'll return with bundle analyzer like i've done here and you'll pass a couple of settings number one you'll set enabled to true when the analyze environment variable is true number two you're going to set open analyzer to false what this open analyzer setting does is every time you save your application if that's set to true it'll open a new tab for the bundle analyzer and if you turn that on within about five minutes you'll have a thousand tabs in your browser it's very annoying so i just recommend just turning that off right out of the gate once you've got that set up you go into your env file and set analyze equals true this will turn on bundle analyzer and then the next time your application starts up, Bundle Analyzer will generate HTML files at these two places. There'll be one um, for the client bundle at the first boulder, and then there'll be one for the server boulder, the, the, the server bundle at the second uh, folder there, that second file. And once you go and open up those HTML files, this is what the page is going to look like. Um, it's pretty cool. You can see that it's organized by all the different chunks for your application. So um, if you ever go and like look at the JS that gets served up to the browser, you'll see a main JS. Um, there'll be a, a 404 JS for the 404 page. For your um, generic page slug, there'll be a, a block for that, and then one for the app. Um, you can see that inside of the 404 and the, the page slugs, um, that node modules out of the box take up the majority of, of the space in those chunks. Um, and you can see over here, it's kind of small. We'll zoom in in a second. Um, here are all your components. They take up a relatively small size or really relatively small portion of the bundle that's sent up to the browser. If you open up the sidebar, you can zoom in on these chunks and you can focus on just the ones that you're interested in. So. Um, here, I've just clicked on the page slug and zoomed in on that. And again, you can see that node modules is taking up most of the space in this bundle. Um, Sitecore JSS libraries are taking up a pretty good amount of space. And then here are all the components. And you can mouse over each one of these blocks and it'll actually tell you exactly how many kilobytes or megabytes uh, they're contributing to the chunk. So that was the client side bundles. This is the server side bundle. It looks a little bit different. Um, if you take a look at it, one of the things that you'll notice right away is that all of these server-side bundles, um, they've got document.js in them, um, and you didn't see that in the client bundles. And that's because document.js is only executed on the server. It's never executed on the client and doesn't need to get shipped up. So to recap, the Next.js bundle analyzer is handy for diagnosing bundle size issues. You can also use it to find code that doesn't belong in the client or shouldn't be sent up to the browser, and you can enable it with a config plugin like we talked about before. Here's the documentation for that if you're interested. And we're on to our last tip, and this is my, probably my favorite tip, patch package. Patch package is a really handy utility that allows you to patch node modules. So, you can go and make changes inside of your node modules folder using patch package, and it will generate a patch that's integrated into your repo and code base. And then you can share this with your team and even integrate it into your production builds. To get started, you just do npm install patch package like this. And then you modify your package JSON to add a post install script that will call patch package. And what this does is it just says, um, anytime npm install is run, right after that, execute patch package. So with that set up, you can go and start making changes to files in your node modules folder. So um, this this is a, a file from the is even package under node modules is even index.js. So if you wanted to make a change to that, you could go straight into your node modules folder, open up a file in there and is even and make a change. So for example, if you wanted to make it so that is even returns true and only true on Mondays, this would be the code to do that. Then you've got this change in your node modules folder. If you want to share this with your team, what you do is you'd go to your console, you'd run npx patch package and give it the name of the package that you modified. Patch package is then going to go download a clean version of that package 
and it's going to diff it against the package that's in your node modules folder and it's going to figure out what's different between those two and it'll create a patch file for that it then puts that patch file in the patches folder of your repo and you can check that into git and share it with your team another cool thing um, that i highly recommend that you do is anytime that you create a patch use this command that they give you here and go and open up an issue with the package maintainer so that they can be aware of like what kind of things people are, are needing to change in their package and hopefully integrate in that for everyone to use. The patch files will look like this. They just look like a git diff pretty much. Again, this is in the patches folder at the root of your repo. You check this in the source control. And then the next time that you run npm install um, on your, your repo, then um, after npm install finishes, you'll see that patch package will run. It'll apply any patches in that patches folder. And yeah, then that functionality is available for all team members or your production build. I'm gonna warn you, use this sparingly. This is a very powerful tool, but you shouldn't just be going to this immediately anytime you, you run into an issue. Um, but we just gotta be realistic that um, oftentimes maintainers will fix bugs in their packages, like that uh, component level data fetching function bug that I talked about before, and you can't upgrade to JSS 21.6.4, for example. You could use patch package to backport that into your older version of JSS and, and fix that bug. So to recap, use patch package to modify node modules. It creates pack patches in the patches folder in your repo. Always submit issues for patches to the package maintainers and use this tool sparingly. Further reading here, if you're interested. And I can be found at all these places if you want to reach out to me later. Um, and I think we've got some time for questions now. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are open for questions. So um, participants can mute themselves and uh, discuss directly with the Kuri, if you have any questions or anything you want to discuss. No questions? Yeah. If you I think want, we are uh, you can reach out to me on Slack anytime at Psychori. I'm happy to discuss. Yes, and uh, I think it was an amazing session. And as like we were talking earlier, I have also worked on the headless project, but some of the stuff was also new for me that I didn't know before. And now I have knowledge of it. And one of the things I liked was that recap slide. That was very helpful <laughs> at the end of every tip so that we can remember what or we can refer that in the future as well to quickly uh, get the idea of all the tips and tricks. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all for joining. Have a good evening. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.